James. Hi, Steve. Is, uh, first off, uh, what led you to part ways with Jeff and what are you looking for in a new coach? Um, <clears throat> well, first off, I apologize for being a few minutes late here. I hope I didn't keep everyone waiting. It just was tied up on a phone call. Um, uh, so anyway, appreciate your patience uh, with me. Um, Helene, um, you know, I guess ultimately uh, to make a coaching change or to make that, to take that decision, I felt, you know, a team fundamentally that we'd kind of, I don't know if even plateaued is the right word, but uh, we'd gotten to a point where um, you know, fundamentally with and without the puck, we had regressed. Um, and, you know, we're at a point now where I felt like, okay, I've got to see, you know, bringing in a new coach, a new coaching staff um, can make a difference to get us back on track, to get us going in the right direction. And so ultimately, I guess that is the, the simplest or biggest reason I make the change. And what are you looking for in a new coach? Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know that I could sit here and say I want specifically this or specifically uh, that. Um, you know, it's <laughs> I'm looking for. You know, I don't know really how to answer that. What specifically I'm looking for? Obviously, um, there are areas of the game we need to improve upon, and I'm hoping a new coach can uh, a, a, a new voice, a new coach, a different approach, uh, maybe a different way of doing things. We can. Uh, improve the play, our team play, and and the play of our players individually. Um, because I think that you know, we're not going to get rid of every single player here. We have some very good players, but they have to improve in a lot of different areas. And I'll be specific with each of them as I meet with them uh, here uh, in the off season. Um, so, you know, I don't know that there's a lot of, my experience has been there's different personalities and different ways of coaches being successful. Um, and, you know, I intend to look at all different, I guess, avenues or, or different leagues, different backgrounds of coaches. I am not going to restrict myself to, to any, you know, particular uh, uh, resume in, in who I determine the next coach will be. And just one last one, when you took the job now three years ago, you described it as an awesome opportunity uh, to, put, to, to rebuild a team. Where do you think you're at? I think we're at the end of year three and the beginning of year four. Yeah. Can you dial a little more into it? I mean, are you, you feel like you've... <laughs> um... You know, again, I do not, you know, I keep asked on where you at in the rebuild, what's the timeline when you're going to make the playoffs. I, you know, I wish I could give you definitive answers to those questions. I'm not necessarily trying to be witty or coy or anything like that. It's just like, we've got a draft coming up in two months and I don't even know if we're picking eighth, first, second, ninth or 10th to let alone tell you, okay, we're going to pick uh, 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 any position for that matter. And that, player is going to play on our team and 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 that's going to project us to being finishing in the standings next year it's just so much uncertainty and then we have free agency coming up on july 1 i have this beautiful list of great players on there that would be a good fit for our organization can i get any of those players i have no idea at this point so Hey, we're just going to continue with trying to draft well, trying to develop our young players, try to run a good program here in Detroit, and try to run a good program in Grand Rapids, and kind of gradually keep improving. And that's what I'm going to stick with. And and hopefully sooner than later, we're a playoff team. And I, and I would love to be able to stand here or sit here and say, hey, here's the exact plan. This is what we're doing. And this is when we're going to be a playoff team. And we're going to win the cup this year. Uh, and I, you know, I'd be a fool, an idiot to say that. And I know you don't expect me to say that no absolutely not uh, thanks steve max ballman hey steve i'm just curious do you feel like i mean does this in your mind signal that you know your expectations though are going up for this team i mean to, to make a coaching change should that be kind of taken that way um i don't know that my expectations have really changed max uh again i just you know i we just finished our th 
third year with me as a general manager. I worked with the coaching staff for three years. There's been a lot of good things done. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and again, I, I was, you know, speak publicly about this because Jeff and I and his coaching staff have discussed this. We have struggled defensively. Part of the reason is it personnel? Yes, to be, you know, uh, state the obvious. Um, but we've been unable to, with the group that we've had, uh, you know, specifically in that area, to get better, to, to, to get our team to play uh, both individually and collectively a sounder defense of hockey team and it's been three years we've been trying it hasn't been from a lack of discussion a lack of effort on our coaching staff's behalf or we're trying we just haven't been able to do it so i look at this now as a hey, that's an area that's going to have to improve in in order to do that i'm going to bring in a new coach and see if he can't do that with the group that we have if you know there'll be some changes on our on our on our roster to what extent i can't really say that at this point but there will be changes and and uh uh, with a new coaching staff coming in with some potential changes. My expectation, I guess, is that we're going to improve. And my expectation will be that we improve in that area. And then I guess personnel wise, it sounds like the blue line may be here. But when you talk about that list of free agents you'd like to target, where do you think, you know, you'd like to add this, this offseason? Uh, I wouldn't uh, honestly specifically target just just the blue line. I think, you know, we've got some decisions to make on our roster in in all three, you know, in goal, on defense and, and up front. And we'll look at all the different areas that you can improve that, whether it's our, our younger players in our system um, taking a next step into the NHL, uh, even for that matter, the trade market, which I, you know, I hesitate to even say that because I don't foresee there being a real, um, you know, trade that we can, that would make sense and maybe something will come up. And then it's free agency and try to add to that. But you look at all, all the forward positions are, are D and there's, you know, depending on what extent we go with changes or don't bring players back, there may be more or less, uh, uh, more or fewer spots on the roster to, to need to address. And then just two quick things I wanted to clarify. Um, Alex Tangay and LJ Scarpace, are they, they're remaining on staff now or you haven't made? Yes. Any? Okay. And then the, there's the new agreement with the Swedish Federation. Um, there's, I think, a new age that players at 24 have to be offered back to their club. Does, do you see that as a big obstacle, or is that something that you feel like as you start to bring some of these guys over, you'll be able to still do? I don't know if the teams are allowed to kind of sign off. Their, their teams and they're allowed to kind of sign off on that if they come over or? Yeah, you know, I... Uh, I got to, you know, ref, I will have to refresh my recollection and understanding of some of those rules in Europe because uh, when we're, I'm not using them every day, they kind of they go, you know, a little bit become a little bit vague. I do not see it as an issue uh, whether we want to bring a play player over to play. No, I'm not not really concerned about that. Okay, thank you. Answer, Khan. Yes, yeah, Steve. Uh... Just to, when you look back at the season as a whole, I mean, things seem to be going fairly well uh, just past the midway point, And then just things kind of came a little bit off the rails here the last couple of months. Just why do you think that happened? I mean, what 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 turned? I mean, what what did you see in the team's play over the last couple of months? Well, um, I'll start by saying if you go back and look at our schedule and then you look at the teams we were going to play in February and March and in particular on the road, we recognized that, you know, our record was, was, was reason was decent. We were pleased with our record in the first half of the season, but having said that, um, you know, our record wasn't good against the top teams. We were starting to beat the teams, uh, uh, that are, you know, uh, uh, um, com comparable to us, say in the standings or in the rebuilding process or whatnot, we were fairly competitive against them. We did we did have a tough time with the elite teams, even in the early uh, part of the season. As the season went on, we had you know, again Colorado, uh, uh, Tampa, Florida, Toronto, all these games coming back to back to back. So we knew it was going to be bigger challenge in the second half. Um, uh, so uh, that's part of it. Um, was it a, hey, our team, whether we're, you know, we're not good enough to sustain this level of play throughout the season, uh, I would think would be maybe a little bit of it. Um, but ultimately fundamentally as a team, we need to improve 
as a group defensively. Individually, our players need to get better defensively. And as a team, our, the structure of the way we play has to improve. And, and again, I go back to wasn't, you know, wasn't that we as a staff and I include management and the coaches and that wasn't like we didn't address it. We just weren't successful in, in, in applying it and getting our players to play or getting our team to play much better defensively. And, and as the season went on, you combine a, a tougher schedule, we start to lose players to injury and, and the, the losses mounted and in particular the ugly losses. Because of the way things went defensively to, would that, make you more inclined to to look for a coach who has a, a background uh in and just is it's kind of a defensive coach or kind of somebody who works well in, in improving defenses um i'm not uh, you know i'm looking you know I ultimately i think all all good coaches all successful coaches whether they're coaching junior hockey, college hockey, uh, any, any of the top leagues at the top levels around the world. I don't think you de necessarily define them in one particular, whether he's a defensive guy, an offensive guy, a player's coach or a militant coach, whatever. Good coaches adjust and they, and they do what they have to do with the personnel that they have and find a way to make it work. And you know, you look at all the top teams in the league right now, they're all a little bit different. They all have their, you know, areas that they're really good at, but, uh, and, and areas that you, you know, hey, there, here's the reason they may not win, but ultimately they're pretty balanced. And I wouldn't describe any of these top teams in the league today as having a, oh, he's strictly a defensive minded coach or he's an offensive minded coach. So uh, again, at the end of the day, good coaches, uh, you know, address, know what the needs of their team are and have certain standards and, and try to get their players to play to that. Now, having said all that, I probably should have started right at the beginning. Like I've worked with Jeff and his staff for three years here. Um, and he was here for you know, what four years as a coach before I got here. And, and I believe four years in, or three years in GR maybe, and one here as an assistant, um, you know, I sit here and say, Jeff Blaschel is a good hockey coach. He ran a really good program and you all recognize like kind of what's, what's, I can certainly attest to what's been our program for the, for the last three years. Cause it's been dictated by me under the circumstance where I'm trying to rebuild, um, this team, we're trying to, you know, uh, add, prospects add draft picks and whatnot and in turn we're letting our veterans go as opposed to re-signing them i really and I, I say this sincerely jeff did an outstanding job of leading this this team this organization in a very very difficult circumstance pardon the expression but he ran a good program this wasn't a complete shit show now uh, you know it you know we were organized our guys practiced hard and can you imagine, like you're sitting on that side, having to sit here uh, every day and answer your questions after the games and, and say it with dignity and, and be supportive and be positive. That's a really hard thing to do. And so I, I, you know, I said it after year one, I think I said it after year two, you cannot uh, judge Jeff Blaschel on the Detroit Red Wings record. I think you judge it on how he ran this program and conducted himself and, and was extremely professional in that. And, and I think it's really unfair to put it on, on the coach. Having said that, you know, for three years, I'm making a change today for the reasons I stated earlier. Thanks, Steve. Got a call, Finn? Hey, Steve. Hey, down in Grand Rapids, how, what did you think of Jonathan Berggren's season and how close is he to being NHL ready at this point, Steve? Um, we're very pleased with the season that Jonathan had, you know, as you know, we left him there the entire season. We decided at the end not to recall him, um, you know, as an adjustment coming to play, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, American hockey league versus the Swedish elite league that he played in. Um, there's areas of his game. We asked, to, uh, you know, we asked him to focus on and, uh, and try to improve on and, and he did that. And, we're very happy with his progress. Does he have a, a chance to make the team next year? He does have a chance. Is he a lock to make it? I, uh, I don't think so. Like, honestly, I, a year ago, I was uncertain as to, you know, uh, you know, I thought Moritz could play in the league. I'd had no idea what kind of an impact that he would have. And really with Lucas Raymond at the start of the year, we felt like, you know, he didn't play a lot in the Swedish league last year. We weren't sure he'd be ready. Um, and we were kind of planning that, 
for him not to be ready. And in each step of the training camp and preseason, he, he, he hung in there and he excelled and he made the team. So I sit here today and I say, Hey, I'm not going to pencil Jonathan Berger and into the lineup, but I'm also not going to say, Hey, he's destined to play in GR. Let's see how training camp goes. Let's see how the preseason goes and we'll make a determination at that point. But in, in, in the interim, in the off season, uh, I will try to improve our team. And if I can acquire a player that, that I think is, is going to help us, I intend to do that. It's, I don't sit here and plan on saying, Hey, I'm going to give, you know, prospect a prospect B they're getting a spot on the roster. I am not going to do that. Well, just one more. And it kind of begs kind of segues maybe to another kid. How about the Edmondson kid? I mean, do you expect, I mean, what kind of season did you feel he had in your eyes in, I mean, is he going to get a chance to make the roster, I guess? I think he's in consideration for it. Yes. He, he had a very good year. Um, uh, you know, for Lunda's, you know, we've had several players go through there. They're a very good team, very good organization. I uh, played very well for, for them this year. He's big. He can skate. I, I say big, he's strong. Um, he can skate really well. Um, uh, he does have a chance. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to say a real good chance to, to play in the NHL next year. And again, like it's a little you know, it's a bit of an educated guess based on, you know, like we watch, you know, you watch, okay, this is what Moritz Seider did in the Swedish league last year, kind of compare him to that. Can he, can he have a similar impact? He's a different player than Moritz really. And both very good young prospects, but a little bit of difference in, in the two of them and, and we'll see how he does, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic and we'll see. Appreciate this. Thanks, Steve. Brad Galley. Hey Steve, when you when you came here, I think one of your first press conferences or, or media sessions with us, you pointed out how long building a cup winner takes. Tarasenko, you know, almost eight to ten years in St. Louis when they finally got the cup. Ovechkin taking as long as he did, even the job you guys did in Tampa. The next step for this team is what? I mean, I imagine you, you you'll sign some guys this offseason, maybe make a deal. But are, the, are these jersey holding type of press conferences where you're bringing in sort of elite talent, spending big in the offseason, or trying to? trade some of these prospects for players. Can we expect that this, this off season? Um, Brad, I don't, I don't intend to trade uh, prospects or at least high draft picks um, uh, for, for players say, you know, I don't know what the definition of a veteran player would be. Uh, any of our young player, any of our prospects or our picks, our high picks would I'd like, you know, I would only trade it if we were to do that would be for a young player that's going to fit into the timeline of, you know, of the nucleus of our team with our, with our, I guess our older young players being around 25, 26. I want them to be in that to, to, to grow with them. So as far as signing players and having the press conference, um, I don't really know uh, at this point, there's, there's good players that are potentially pending free agents you know uh, history has shown that the majority of them resign or uh, prior to free agency and then of the group that's left you have more than half the league competing for them so you're lucky to get one if any and generally in getting them you're probably going beyond what you really want to do to get them so it's difficult that I, I don't plan for free agency like we'll we'll get try to you know we'll explore free agency and try to get it but i just find it's a kind of a fruitless effort to say hey, we're we're getting this player on july 1 and this is what we're prepared to pay him and we're going to get him and half the time you don't even get a chance to make the call cuz he's already signed thanks for the time john neo Hey, Steve, uh, as you come up with a list of candidates and interviews here, I'm, I'm wondering how much time do you think you'll spend um, sort of outside that NHL, AHL pool, the more traditional, I guess. And then along those same lines, I think it's been 20 years since we've had a European head coach. Do you think whatever obstacles that have been there maybe are less so these days with the way things have changed with the NHL? Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what, obstacles necessarily you're referring to i would say at this or reluctance stage, i guess i should say i don't know yeah it just hasn't happened doesn't happen yeah for whatever reasons yeah, i'm not really right. sure right i would say at this stage john um i'm not gonna and i don't have a list yet and i you know i'm gonna put a uh, i've got a few names kind of 
bouncing around in my head and I've been a busy couple of days here. So what I, at this stage, I'm not going to restrict my search or my long list to any particular criteria as he has to be a head coach. He has to have NHL experience. He, this or that, I'm just going to put a long list of names together from, from the people that I talk to from articles that are written with names that come up that maybe that any of you know that I'm not familiar with or, or that I hadn't thought of and write them all down and, and do my own background work on them all and then put together a shorter list of guys that I, for various reasons that I think I really want to talk to and, uh, and we'll go from there, but I'm, I'm not going to it today kind of restrict it to any particular like tight narrow set of uh um uh requirements i guess or experiences or lack of experience for that matter it, and from what you just said it sounds like you don't really have a a short timetable here necessarily i mean do you have one in your head where you'd like to have this done by a certain date i, I really don't have a date for you i'd say i'd rather do this sooner than later but it's it's not happening tomorrow and, and hopefully it's done before the first day of training camp. Thanks, Steve. Bob Duff. Steve, this is kind of similar to John's first question there, but uh, you look around the league, you look at Toronto, Tampa Bay, Florida, they just a few that come to mind. They all have guys. It's their first NHL job and they're all teams that could legitimately win the Stanley cup. You've hired two coaches in Tampa and neither of them had a previous NHL experience. It seems like that's less, you know, less, I don't know what the word is, uh, necessity is maybe. Like, it seems like teams are more open to that. Is that, am I reading that wrong or is it just coincidence? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, honestly, I guess I, I don't really know. I, you know, you look at, uh, you mentioned like uh, Jared Bednar in, in Colorado. I think Joe hired, I think it was uh, uh, Jared was in the minors working with him. I think the avalanche were his first NHL experience. Uh, it kind of goes, uh, I think a little bit in cycles, maybe um, over time that there's a group of coaches that work within the league for a certain period of time. And then a new group kind of comes along a little bit like starting goaltenders, maybe for that matter, you know, that you get a group that come in and establish themselves and are there for a long time. But I don't have any, uh, I think we're just making a mistake if, if we limit ourselves to, uh, um, you know, a specific criteria and just because a guy's worked in the league doesn't entitle him to the right to get another job. And likewise, we shouldn't exclude these young minds that, uh, you know, whether it's a Sheldon Key for, uh, um, you know, say John Cooper, uh, I had the for good fortune of working with John in, in, he was our coach in the minors for the better part of three years. So having gone from Guy Boucher, who was first year in the league, uh, first head coaching job to a second coach uh, with the first time I was at my comfort was in I knew the guy I'd worked with the guy and into my you know, what limited experience I had or expertise that I had was like, I'm confident he'll be, he'll do a good job in this role. So um, again, I think, you know, and, you know, I can't speak for why, you know, uh, Joe decided to go with Jared or, or Kyle decided to go with Sheldon, but they both had worked with them within their organization and had a certain comfort level with promoting them and confidence in them that they would be ready to do that job. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're going into this with an open mind and a clean slate and hoping to find the guy who's going to wow you and say, this is our guy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I get, I, I, I'm not specifically looking for a guy with no experience and well, I mean, I'm it's not, like you're not looking for a specific type is what I'm trying to say. You're, no, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really not. And what I'd like, to kind of reveal a little more than I really care to. I, I find it difficult to really, uh, um, you know, you uh, hire people that you don't really know that you haven't worked with or somebody that you've really worked closely with and knows, knows kind of the way I want things done or the way I do things. Um, that's a bit of a challenge. And I'm going to see that, you know, I'm going to have to overcome that and, and 
obviously this is an important decision for us and and I'm hoping to make obviously a good decision. So, uh, but I don't want to rule anything out or exclude anyone or anybody with because uh, they have coached or because they haven't coached or they've not been in North America or whatnot. So, um, I'm trying to say as much as possible with and actually say nothing if you haven't figured that out right now. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Steve. Okay. Larry Lage. Hi, Steve. I think I, I think we picked up on that. Um, you mentioned uh, a few names bouncing around your head. Uh, would Mike Babcock be one of them? Um, you know, I would say to you, I don't think it would be appropriate to comment on or give you an idea of anybody that might be uh, uh, on my list. Again, it's a, you know, I, I, we made a change two days ago. Uh, the last two days, of, you know, we got players that are leaving for the world championships and coming and going. I'm trying to, wrap up end of the year things and and i'll not a you know i'm going to look at everybody and but I, I i will not comment on any specific name in general whether they're i'm a, i have interest or don't art regner hi steve art how are you i am doing well thank you um i guess i'm not trying to pin you down either and it is rest assuring that you hope they have a coach in place by training camp but uh would you really seriously like to have the coach in place by the NHL draft? I mean, put to try to put some sort of timeline on it. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I, by the draft before free agency. Um, yeah. Again, I like sooner than later, like I, I don't foresee this going uh, um, much beyond the end of the finals and then please don't read into that as meaning anything, but you know, once we're getting close to the draft, you really want to focus on the draft. And then as soon as the draft ends, you're right into free agency. So I'd prefer to have, to the extent that it's possible, uh, have the coach in place prior to the draft as just for, you know, the, the process of what we need to do in the off season. I know Grand Rapids, I think we all do that Grand Rapids is essential in the development and for the Red Wings organization. Are you evaluating their coaching staff is this uh are you going to try to reorganize maybe the entire organization this off season or or are you happy with what's going on in gr i'm pleased with the coaching staff in grand rapids um this has been maybe even more so in the american league than the nhl it's been really challenging to run a program with uh um taxi squads and and covid restrictions and things like that travel restrictions uh, ben and his staff and GR have done a fantastic job. I'm really happy with that, and I don't foresee any changes there. Um, how about your own unrestricted free agents? Are I, I know everything comes at a whirlwind now for you, but are you uh, are you planning on offering some guys, or are you going to let them all know exactly what your plans are? A little bit of everything. Like every every <laughs> every player's. Uh, situation is a little bit unique to them and, and our needs. So um, I, I will, you know, the last two days have really uh, had a chance to meet with the players that are, uh, whether they're going to the world championships or in a hurry to, to go to their off season home for various reasons, met with them. Some of the older guys have, you know, the reality is they have kids in school. They're not in a hurry to leave. And so I will meet with them and some of them happen to be some of our unrestricted free agents. And even we've got a couple of restricted free agents that I've got to make decisions on uh, as well. So I plan on meeting with them and telling them what I know at this point and what I, you know, and, and being honest. And in some cases that is simply, I need to wait. I can't make, I'm not going to make a decision one way or the other until I'm ready to make that decision. And, and uh, you know, that's kind of a case for a couple of our guys at the position they were in at this time last year as well, that I need to wait. And I'll, you know, if I can offer you something, I will. And if I can, I'll let you know as soon as I know. And in some cases we're able to bring guys back and in others, we opted not to, or they opted to go. Um, and one final question. And uh, I know most of us on this zoom call have worked with Jeff for a number of years and know that he is a top notch, decent man and treats everybody with dignity and respect as you have alluded to. I'm kind of curious. I mean, you have to make tough decisions in your role and it, you know, and this is a hockey decision, uh, but how does that wear on you uh, from a personal, you know, I mean, it's probably got, is this the most difficult aspect 
of your job in a way is to tell whether it be a coach or a player that it's time to part ways. Yeah. Um, I honestly you don't enjoy it. Nobody likes to deliver bad news or to, to tell a player, um, you know, I'm not offering you a contract, even trading players is, you know, you feel bad at times. You feel terrible at times. You got guys that are their, their wives are pregnant, seven months pregnant and you're trading them. Like it, it's hard on, on the players, but you know, when I, when I wanted to become a general manager, I knew what I was getting into. I knew that, you know, you got to do make difficult decisions. You got to have uncomfortable conversations um, do I enjoy them? No, I don't enjoy them. And I hope, honestly, I hope I never enjoy them. Um, but it's part of the job and it's what we kind of sign up for. And, um, you know, it, you just have to do it. And, uh, like I said, I was aware of what I was getting into. Um, at least I thought I did. And then once you're in it, you're like, Ooh, you know, but, um, I, again, I, it is part of the job and you have to do that. And, uh, we all accept it. And whether you're a, uh, gosh, a manager, a coach, a player, anybody, we all at times, uh, we, we have to deliver bad news. And at times we all have to hear the bad news too. Great. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Okay. Mike Stone. Hey, Steve. Um, the goaltending kind of mirrored the way this team went. It was pretty good early and then went down. Can you talk about uh, your feelings on the goaltending situation and uh, how close is uh, Sebastian Kosa from being in the NHL? Um, well, I'll start with Sebastian. You know, he's, he's a 19 year old playing in junior hockey in Western Canada. He's had a pretty good year. Um, is he ready to play in the NHL next year? I would say today I'd, I'd have to say no. Uh, he, um, I think he's a ways away that, you know, to manage the kind of the expectation of him. He's on a very good team at Edmonton in the Western league. Uh, I'm, I'm following their playoffs closely for the most part. He's had a pretty good year. He's had a pretty good start to the playoffs. Uh, you know, selfishly, I'm hoping his team goes very far. That would be great for him. Great experience for him where he plays next year. Um, you know, we won't determine that until the off season. So uh, I, I don't expect him to, to see him at the NHL level next year uh, at all. And, and to what extent, when I really have no idea at this point, but uh, he's a good young prospect. That's a tough position as we always know, as we all know, excuse me. And, and not that I want to rush anybody. I'm definitely not, you know, going to, you know, rush a goaltender. Um, I'm just going to let his play determine at which level he'll play at even next year for that matter. Um, our goaltending in Detroit, you know, I had actually had a chance to meet with uh, uh, Alex today. He's off to the world championships for the U S and, and you know, my words to, to him were, you know, it was an up and down year. He at, at times had great games. He had some not so great games. Some of that, was due to our, our overall team play. What I really encouraged by like, this could have been, you know, a tough situation for any goalie, per, you know, particularly young, young guy who's, you know, doesn't have a ton of experience. Like he survived it, you know, and he's not a, he's not a basket case today, you know, um, that I, I think it showed his mental toughness and it's good for him in that, uh, he battled the ups and downs. He didn't get too carried away with things when they went well for him. And, and there was some tough nights out there and it was hard for him to, to get in there. And he had to go back in the next night and stop pucks and, and through it all, he survived and, 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 uh, you know, particularly tough stretch for our entire team there, maybe in February, early March and, and got through it and played some several good games after it. So at the end of the year, I think it was a positive year for him. Uh, Thomas Grice, again, had his ups and downs and played really well at times. How much of it I can pin on goaltending, you know, versus our own team play? Um, maybe, maybe a little bit of both, you know. Um, but again, it's, a, it's an area we need to be better in. And uh, whether it's, you know, keeping the same guys or we go and look out for somebody else, try to improve it. We'll see if we can do that as well. One final thing. Uh, hindsight's always 2020. Do you, um, I don't know, regret maybe not making the coaching change after last year, the pool of candidates for uh, what would have nope. been different to be. No, Stoney, you know, um, no, I don't. Honestly, I'm, uh, I was comfortable with the decision. I've actually had a chance to reflect on that in the last two weeks, uh, you know, and I'm like, you know what, I, I had my reasons for doing uh, making that decision last year and I look back on them and reflect on them and I'm totally comfortable with that decision that I made. And, you know, I sit here today, you know, and, you know, I, I, I had my reasons I'm comfortable with them and, and, 
we make this decision now and we move forward. I've made a lot of decisions over the course of my managerial career, I guess. And we always look back and you second guess yourself and all that. I'm getting you know a little bit better at make your decision, move on. You got other things to work, worry about. Don't, don't waste time worrying about the past, reflect on it, learn from it. But again, I think I, I believe for the reasons I did last year, I'm comfortable with that. And, and, you know, even regardless of how this year went, if you'd have told me how it would have went, I'm comfortable with what I did last year. Thank you. Kevin Allen. Yes, yeah, Steve, you already addressed Edmondson and Bergman, but I wondered what your thoughts were. You know, you had two or three players that also played well in the era, Vero, Johansson, Soderstrom. Um, have you made any decisions about whether you'll bring them over next year or will you continue to keep them over there? Um, well, uh, Elmer, Elmer isn't signed to a contract yet. I had a chance to run into his agent last week while I was in Germany at the U18s. Had a brief, just, just an informal chat that we, we both have a mutual interest in trying to come to some sort of contractual agreement. We would, you know, all three of the players you mentioned, um, we would like to bring them over to play in North America next year, um, whether that's uh, whether they you know make the Detroit Red Wings or or play in the American Hockey League remains to be seen. But uh, we're we're very uh, excited about having all three of them in, in in our system and and closer to you know as they're I think they're all roughly 21, 22, or twenty years old right now. I'm trying to think which years they were drafted, twenty and older. Um, they have a chance to you know to be NHLers, and is that in the fall? You know, I'm not sure yet, but we would hope to bring all three over. But first things first, uh, Elmer's, uh, uh, Elmer's with the Swedish national team, I think, right now. I know he is right now. And I'm hoping he makes their roster for the World Championships. Uh, um, Emil had a very good year in Finland. And, uh, and Albert is in the finals uh, with Fariestad playing uh, uh, Lulia, I think, right now. I think game two is today. I'm not sure if that game ended already. It probably has ended, but... Uh, playing very well. And so we're encouraged to get them all over here, but number one, we got to, hopefully we can work out a contract with Elmer and then decide on what's the right thing to do, but we would like to bring them over. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of Elmer, um, you know, every day, it seems like there's another highlight goal. Would it be fair to say he's been the biggest surprise given where he was drafted? I mean, he's really sort of come on, uh, especially this season. Yeah. I think the last year he really started to you know, everybody started to catch uh, his eye. You know, we have Nicholas Cronwall over there, Danny Cleary, and, and you know, prior to uh, his new role, Hork, Sean Horkoff was, you guys are pretty heavily involved with the kids. They stay on top of it. Uh, they communicate with them on a regular basis. So even going back to last year, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the staff was pretty aware that he's really starting to make strides and come along. And, uh, you know, this year now we, you know, on, you know, we get to see on Twitter or Instagram, some of the, the, the spectacular goals, even the one he scored, I think yesterday, the day before, They're pretty fun to watch. It's pretty encouraging. Um, uh, is he a huge surprise for us at this point? Um, based on what he's done over the last couple of years, his progress weren't, you know, we're pretty excited about it. Um, it sure is a, a pleasant surprise, you know, um, but we've said, you know, we can't, we need, we need some surprises within our drafts. We can't just expect to pick in the top 10 every year, get a good player. It's going to take a long time to build your, a team that way that we need some of these players that are second through seventh rounders to make it. They're not all going to uh, make it, but looks like he's got a, a good opportunity. He's real. Again, you, you, you see the highlights. You may have seen some of his games, but He's a really good athlete. He's a big yeah. man, big young man, you know, but he's very, very athletic and his, his jumping ability is uh, coordination and whatnot. And, and that bodes well, bodes well for the future. And generally the kind of uh, maybe an unscientific rule is seems to be the big guy, the guys that are bigger, that uh, it takes them a little bit longer to kind of grow into their body, so to speak. And he looks to be doing that. But I remember when we had him over here two years ago in training camp, and we do some fitness tests and uh, it was, it was pretty exciting to see where he was at. It wasn't like, Oh, when this guy gets strong or when this guy gets powerful, it was like, he's already powerful and he's already explosive. Can you imagine, you know, uh, as he continues to work at it, where the potential is here. So I don't want to overhype him and I'm not trying to overhype him, but we're, we're cautiously optimistic that he'll be, you know, a real good NHLer. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Bob Wanowski. Hey there, Steve. Um, 
looking at your roster, obviously you added Cider and Raymond, and they certainly look like foundational pieces going forward. How many foundational pieces do you think you're certain you have on the roster right now that will be here when it's time to win and through? And how many does a really good NHL team need, do you think? Um, uh, Wojo, those are really good questions, and I don't have really good answers for them. Um, I don't know how many foundational pieces you need. You need a bunch of good players to win. Um, you know, whether, you know, like a salary cap kind of dictates, um, you know, how many you can afford, I guess, and how you allocate that depends on your own preference. And really it depends on what stage of their career they're, they're at. Um, I'd, I'd prefer not to speculate. I actually, I'd have to give it some thought, first of all, uh, as to what, what we have within our system, how many foundational, uh, you know, players or p uh, pieces we have. And, and on our team, I, I mean, I'm, I'd rather not even go there because <laughs> honestly, I'm not even like, I'm not sure like guys career trajectories go in different directions, you know, and I hope a lot of them because I like these guys, they're good guys, you know, they, they're, they, they're trying hard, they're working hard, I, you know, it's a good group and as um, I'm hoping we can be more successful sooner than later because as you're, as you're around your team and around your players, you get to know them, you really grow fond of them. And, and the guys you're not fond of, honestly, you get rid of them. <laughs> so um, for, for various reasons, but uh, so again, I don't know the, the, the exact number it's, and I don't even want to kind of throw out a, a it's this or that. So just a real quick follow-up. You said this didn't, this move doesn't indicate a shift in expectations um, raise them or whatever. What about it, impatience level? And and is it tempting or or do you want? Is it tempting to get impatient and try to accelerate things? Um, not not really. What what I you know the the danger becomes you 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 start to get a little maybe impatient. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Desperate. I'm not sure what the right word is. And then you do something, you do something stupid, you know, and, and I don't need any help doing anything stupid. Uh, like I'll probably do it without any. So the fewer times I can do that, but like I, again, when you try to really like for anytime I've tried to force something, force a trade, force, force a signing, I've kind of regretted it for different reasons. So I think you just have to remain patient, you know, quite frankly, I think I'll be more, I'll, I'll be, it'll be easier for me to be patient than it will for yourself. You know, like you're going to want to see results, want to see it. And I understand it. And, and up for me, it's going to, you know, for me, I've got to show some improvement. I can't sit here forever saying, Hey, be patient, everybody. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. I believe we're starting to, you know, we're, we're, we're showing some improvement, although you were to say, Steve, I watch a team. I'm sorry. I don't see it. I see it from a different perspective and that, you know, we've, we've got a, uh, you know, a prospect pool that's, that's grown in the, in the three years that I've been here, we're moving some of these prospects into our lineup. Some of the, the kids, even the Michael Rasmussen say uh, that, that, that were drafted prior to me are coming here are, are moving up the, the depth chart moving, you know, playing bigger roles. So, there is some progress, albeit very slowly. Um, but again, I've just found when I've really tried to force something, not necessarily rush it, but try to force it, try to do something to, to speed things up or whatnot, um, it hasn't worked as well as I would hope. So try to, you know, even with, you know, trade, trying to force to trade, trying to force a free agent signing, I really want this guy, I'm going to get him at all costs. It, it, generally doesn't work out for the better. I think you really have to remain disciplined and wait for the right opportunities. We're only asking for five free agent signings this off season. So. Well, you may get five. You might not like any of them, but <laughs> you might get five. Okay. Thanks. Last question, Carlos Monarez. Yeah, Steve, you've uh, hired two coaches uh, with varying degrees or different degrees of success. What did you learn about the process that you went through in hiring those two coaches? Um, uh, Carlos, uh, uh, they were very, my, uh, I hired Guy Boucher when I was first hired in Tampa. Um, and I didn't know Guy, I knew of Guy Boucher. I hadn't met him before. I didn't know him. I hadn't worked with him. Um, but again, as I'd said earlier, 
and when I hired John, I'd worked with John for three years. What I have generally found, and by no means am I restricting myself or limiting myself to just hiring somebody that I know, but I've found, you know, it, it's harder to, to really, it's harder to hire someone um, that you, that you don't know, or you haven't worked with because you're, you're kind of get you know, it's a little bit of an educated guess, you know, and, uh, but what I did like, um, you know, it was interesting, and I won't go, uh, go into the other people that I interviewed, but I interviewed three, ultimately three people seriously for the job when I hired Guy Boucher and, and three outstanding interviews. And I walked away going like, geez, I, honestly, I'd be happy with any of the three of these guys. And, and they had very varying degrees of experience and completely different backgrounds. And, and uh, ultimately I chose, and I don't look back on the decision as, and regretting it, but I learned like, don't limit yourself to a specific criteria. And I guess I talked about that a little bit earlier. Don't say he has to be, have head coaching experience. Don't say he has to, uh, you know, uh, have coached in the NHL. I, I really think, uh, you know, you do your homework on the people, you look at their track record, where they've been as a player, where they've been as a coach. I try to talk to a lot of people that have worked with them that know me and kind of know my personality and the way I work and, and see if there's a, uh, uh, a potential for there to be a fit, but uh, it really, it really can be challenging. I think uh, when, when you're hiring, maybe that goes for all walks of business or sports and whatnot, um, um, that, that it can be tough when you don't know people. And um, so I guess ultimately what I've learned is don't limit yourself to uh, any specific uh, requirements for the job, you know, and uh, yeah, I guess that would be the answer to your question. And just to, as a follow-up, um, do you have full access? Sorry about that. It's my bird chirping. Uh, do you have full access to Chris Illich's checkbook to hire anybody you want, even your dream hire? Uh, I guess uh, I haven't asked him that question specifically, but uh, um, Chris has, um, has always given me the guidance to Steve you know, you're the general manager of the team, you make the, you know, you make the decisions that our general manager is hired to do. And I will, and he will be supportive. I think in fairness to him, if, uh, if I'm, if I'm breaking the bank, so to speak, I think I owe him the respect to run. And regardless, I, I, you know, he, he, Chris is very passionate about the team and, and, and follows it intently. I, I just think it's wise on my part to, uh, as I go through the process, uh, keep him updated on what I'm doing. But he has, from day one, has given me full support and in whatever direction I wanted to go, and has has really been um, helpful in 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 asking me and um, very pointed questions, uh, you know, important questions to force me to kind of think about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And, and so anyway, I, I think it's safe to say like, uh, Chris, he, he wants to win. He wants to do things the right way. Um, and is fully supportive and, and he and the Detroit Red Wing organization are prepared to do whatever they have to do, uh, whatever he has to do uh, for us to win. We're not going to be restricted by anything. Having said that, um, I don't have the green light to go out and be foolish either. Thanks, Steve. Okay. All right. Those are all the questions we had today. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you.